Murray Bookshin was born in New York City on January the 14th, 1921. His father, Nathan Bookshin, and his mother, Rose Koloskaya, were Russian Jews who migrated to America, like thousands of others, to escape the extreme poverty, the anti-Semitism, and political repression of the Russian Empire. Seidel arrived on New York's Lower East Side with her parents, Murray's grandparents, Seidel Karlat and Moshe Kolutsky, who as revolutionary populists were also fleeing from the Tsarist repression. In the United States, the story of these two families was like that of many other Jewish immigrants. Both families lived on New York's Lower East Side, working as tailors in the infamous sweatshops. It's no coincidence that coming from this political family, Murray's mother, Rose, joined the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, the Revolutionary Libertarian Union. Bookchin's parents soon separated, and as an only child, he was raised largely by his maternal grandmother, Zeidel, lived with him and his mother, Rose. She raised him in the secular and revolutionary environment she knew best, reading Alexander Herzog, known as the father of Russian socialism, and writers like Leon Tolstoy, as intellectual guides and mentors. Murray's first political memory was his grandmother's indignation at the execution of the anarchists Sacco and Vanzetti in 1927. After his grandmother, Zeidel's death when Murray was nine, he joined the Communist Party's Young Pioneers. His intellectual and political education was deeply influenced by the militant Marxism of those years, a historical period marked by the economic crisis precipitated by the Wall Street crash of 1929, the Depression, and the workers' struggles that became increasingly fierce during the New Deal era. Later, as a teenager, he joined the Young Communist League. In 1936, when Murray was just 15 years old, the Civil War broke out in Spain. He tried to enlist in the international brigades, but he was turned down because of his age. He remembers riding the subways, collecting money for the anti-fascists in Spain, while he was also learning about the brutal conflict between the communists, backed by Russia, and the local anarchist movements. That struggle in the Spanish Civil War would prove critical to his political development in the future. De las barriadas extremas de Barcelona van afluyendo al Paseo de Gracia para unirse a la caravana grupos de milicianos que enarbolan la intrépida bandera de la FAI. And I would go on to say that that recurred again in Spain during the Civil War when the anarchists whether one agrees with them or not, advanced the idea of workers' control of industry, of confederation, of regional... Spanish radicalism, in effect, raised questions and provided answers that have a unique relevance to the problems of our day, 
local autonomy, confederalism, collectivism, self-management, and base democracy. In opposition to state centralism, nationalization, managerial control, and bureaucracy. The world did not know this in 1936, nor does it understand the scope of these issues adequately today. Those same years he began working as a steel worker and soon became a trade union organizer, which led to his definitive break with Marxism. Then, following the Stalinist show trials of 1936 and 38 and the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, Murray left the Communist Party and turned to Trotskyism for a period. He realized that the working class, far from being the historical revolutionary subject postulated by Marxist theories, was instead rapidly becoming integrated into the capitalist socio-economic system. Reached the turning point in the United States. It was no longer engaged in what we used to euphemistically in the 1930s called class war. It was based on what we used to Nowadays, call class the workers' struggle, where it still exists, is mostly defensive. It's a struggle to preserve an industrial system that's being replaced by capital intensive and increasingly cybernetic technology. It's a struggle that reflects the last spasms of a disappearing economy. He saw that capitalism was developing into an increasingly accelerated global pace. And its epicenter had shifted from the factory to the ecosystem as a whole, humanity included. The first thing is that it is possible, I believe, to be a person what makes this system ecologically significant rather than economically determined is that it involves the destruction of ecological values like complementarity, mutual aid, a belief in limit, a deep sense of community, and an organic outlook based on unity and diversity. These values and the institutions in which they were embodied have been replaced today by competition, egotism, limitless growth, anime, and a purely means-ends rationality structured around instrumentalism, the belief that reason is merely a tool or a skill rather than an inherent feature of and ordered comprehensible reality. Bookchin identified two phenomena that now proved the destructive potential of this triumphant capitalism. The first was the plundering of the natural environment, and the second was the disintegration of the concept of citizenship. We also have a very strong commitment to democracy, but directly in response to your question, our approach would be educational. 
In an era of commodification, rivalry, and selfishness, this implies including the values of cooperation and communitarianism in the everyday practice of civic life. Treated simply as voters or taxpayers, the city's inhabitants have become abstractions and therefore mere creatures of the state. And it is precisely this perspective that brought Bookchin closer to the political theory of anarchism, especially in the formulation of Peter Kropotkin. I have, it's not a question of living with class warfare. The whole question was one of deepening the socialist and what I would call the libertarian socialist, or if you like, the anarchist ideal, to go beyond... The anarchist ideals of organic community, direct democracy, humanistic technology, and decentralized society are not only desirable, but necessary. And they don't only pertain to a grandiose conception about the future of humanity, but are the essential conditions for human survival in today's world. I want to push my ideals still further and examine hierarchy. The intellectual path that Bookchin took after World War II led him to the elaborate a historical political analysis that was no longer limited to the socio-economic dynamics underlying contemporary society but considered instead the sweeping history of mankind. His aim was to trace the emergence of domination in human society, and at the same time, to trace the emergence of freedom. And it is here that his analysis connected to the anti-hierarchical conceptions of anarchism. but it also gave rise to the very real domination of the young by the old in gerontocracies, of women by men in patriarchies, of one ethnic group by another in the form of racial status hierarchies, and the countryside by the town in urban civilization. All of these systems of domination have a shared origin and derive from common problems, namely, Systems of command and obedience based on hierarchical institutions. One of the key ideas Bookchin formulated as part of his theory of social ecology is that domination over nature is a consequence of man's domination over man. So it is necessary to eliminate this domination and hierarchy in order to bring about a truly ecological society. That is to say, the divisions between society and nature have their deepest roots in divisions within the social realm, namely deep-seated conflicts between human and human that are often obscured by our broad use of the word humanity. To speak of humanity's depredation of nature makes a mockery of the unbridled depredation of human by human as depicted in the tormented novels of Charles Dickens and Emile Zola. Capitalism divided the human species against itself as sharply and brutally as it divided society against nature. In the early 1950s, 
Bookchin began intensive activity as a writer, publishing groundbreaking essays and books that would mark the birth of modern ecological thought. And it was indeed Bookchin who introduced the term ecology into the political debate of the nascent American New Left. Tactical in, terms of media. in the early 1960s, Murray moved back to Manhattan's Lower East Side, which was by then one of the main centers of radicalism and the emerging counterculture. During that decade, he collaborated with the Congress on Racial Equality. He also worked with communards who went on to found some early communal communities such as Coal Mountain Farm. He founded two anarchist groups, the New York Federation of Anarchists and the well-known Anarchos Group. It was in this group that current issues were discussed, such as the ecological crisis and sustainable technologies but also the need for a new form of anarchism that could influence a society of abundance such as the contemporary one, no longer characterized by scarcity. The new left restored the anarchic and utopian visions of the pre-Marxian revolutionary project, and it greatly expanded them in accordance with the new material possibilities created by technology after the Second World War. To tie together the need for solid economic underpinnings of a free society, the new left and the counterculture added certain Fourier-esque qualities. They advanced the image of a sensuous society, not only one that was well-fed, a society free from toil, not only one that was free from economic exploitation, a substantive democracy, not only a formal one, the release of pleasure, not only the satisfaction of need. His influence on the new left reached its peak with his pamphlet, Listen Marxists, published at the end of the decade and strongly critical of the old-fashioned Marxist drift taking place in the student movement and the broader left. It was read by tens of thousands of people. No longer can radical movements afford to plunge unthinkingly into action for its own sake. We have never been in greater need of theoretical insight and study than we are today, when political illiteracy has reached appalling proportions and action has become a fetish as an end in itself. We are also in dire need of organization, not the nihilistic chaos of self-indulgent egoists in which structure of any kind is decried as elitist and centralist. Patience, the hard work of responsible commitment in the day-to-day -day work of building a movement is to be prized over the theatrics of prima donnas who are always willing to die on the barricades of a distant revolution but are too high-minded to engage in the humdrum tasks of spreading ideas and maintaining an organization. The gradual ebbing of the 70s anti-war movement convinced Bookchin that the future of revolutionary action was no longer to be found in large urban centers, but instead in those small towns where the traditions of direct democracy were still somewhat alive and where experiments with new forms of community were possible. To talk to our neighbors, to talk to our communities, and to create those forms, those new political forms. Localism should never be interpreted to mean parochialism, nor should decentralism ever be interpreted to mean that smallness is a virtue in itself. Small is not necessarily beautiful. The concept of human scale, by far the more preferable expression for a truly ecological community, is built around the ability of people to completely grasp their political environment, not to parochially bury themselves in it to the exclusion of cultural stimuli from outside their community's boundaries. 
It did not mean political parties with bureaucracies and leaders and charismatic figures. In 1971, Bookchin moved permanently to Vermont, where the face-to-face -face democracy of the traditional New England town meeting still showed some signs of dynamism. And it was in this context that he elaborated his theories on libertarian municipalism, based on a new idea of bottom-up citizenship and democracy. We're trying to establish more municipal control in our communities. We're trying to reestablish and rehabilitate the town meetings. A population whose only political function is that of electing representatives is not a population but a mass, an agglomeration of monads. A politics understood as a category other than social and governmental implies the reincarnation of the masses in a broadly articulated system of assemblies, as well as the formation of a political body in a space made of discourse, that is to say, of shared rationality, free expression, and radically democratic decision-making procedures. It was in this context that he elaborated the idea of social ecology, a concept which was far removed from the commonplace conservative environmentalism. In 1974, with the anthropologist Dan Chodakoff, he founded the Institute for Social Ecology, which is growing and still active today. His ideas of social ecology can be found in his major works, such as post-scarcity anarchism, the limits of the city, and above all, the ecology of freedom, published in 1980 and widely considered his greatest work. Obvious as this may seem at first in such day-to-day -day problems as caretaking, social ecology raises questions that have far-reaching importance for the different ways society and nature have interacted over time and the problems these interactions have produced. How did a divisive, indeed seemingly combative relationship between humanity and nature emerge? What were the institutional forms and ideologies that rendered this conflict possible? Given the growth of human needs and technology, was such a conflict really unavoidable? And can it be overcome in a future ecologically oriented society? Bookchin's ideas and seminal texts have been translated into many languages, and they have been deeply influential in the anti globalization and municipalism movements of today. They were also adopted on the ground in the Kurdish-led part of northern Syria known as Rojava, where today, despite repressive efforts by the Syrian regime and neighboring Turkey, forms of direct democracy and libertarian communalism are being implemented, which explicitly refer to Bookchin's theory. In the latter part of his life, he continued his intense research activities and harshly attacked the echo technology proposed by his lifelong enemy, that deceptive green capitalism that claims to solve the tragic problems it has created. But, as Bookchin says, it makes no sense to talk about limits of growth in an economy which is instead based on infinite growth because capitalism can no more be persuaded to limit growth than a human being can be persuaded to stop breathing. If the homogenization and destruction of the biosphere is to be reversed, capitalism must simply be replaced. A historic change that requires a great vision. And in the words of Bookchin, Ecological thinking today can provide the most important synthesis of ideas we've seen since the Enlightenment two centuries ago. 
It can open vistas for a practice that can effectively change the entire social landscape of our time. Murray Bookchin died in Burlington, Vermont, on the 30th of July, 2006. And like the old fighter he always was, leaving us with his mighty echo-libertarian vision, composed of thought and action, of critical lucidity and revolutionary imagination. Don't